This video classroom lesson is sponsored by Transmission Bench. Visit the transmissionbench.com store for the deluxe super kit, other parts, and even the video classroom lessons used during this project. I know you've heard the old expression, it's cheaper to keep her. Well, it really is true and makes a lot of sense when you apply it to keeping your old pickup even if it has a bad transmission. I think it's a smart move to fix it. Have you been to any of your local dealerships lately? A new half-ton Chevrolet, Ford, or other brand truck can easily cost $50,000 or more. I recently visited a Chrysler dealership. A quad cab V8 Ram 1500 was priced around $45,000. A top-of-the-line loaded Ram 2500 4x4 was over $67,000. I can't see paying on a $45,000 note, much less a $67,000 one. I know some people can afford them, but maybe you're like me. I can't. So take a second look at your old friend that paid for a truck, even if the transmission has failed it'll cost far less to repair what you already have. Better yet, it's even cheaper if you fix it yourself. Welcome back to class. This is Chrysler 46RE class, part two, lesson one. I know you're ready to get back to our work on our project transmission, but before we go back to the bench, I wanna share something that might inspire you. I want you to meet an old friend of mine. This is my truck. I bought it new in 1997 and 19 years and 243,000 miles later, I still have it. It's paid for and it runs and looks okay, but I have had to work on it. Over the years and along the way, I have had serious problems to fix. I've replaced the cylinder heads once and the water pump three times on the engine. Somehow, I even managed to overheat and ruin the differential pulling a heavy trailer. So, I've replaced the ring and pinion. And yes, I had to take the 46RE transmission out and rebuild it at 175,000 miles. A bearing in the torque converter went bad and sent metal particles all through it. It caused a mess, but I fixed it, and it's worked fine ever since. I've even painted the truck outside in the yard. Around 2013, the finish was gone. Here's what the hood looked like. Not only was the clear coat gone, but also the base paint you could see bare metal. My son and I worked together on it, on the carport and in the backyard. And yes, we did paint it in the open. Because we used a urethane base coat, clear coat paint system, I was able to wet sand and buff out the runs and the bugs. It turned out pretty good. The point is, you can keep your old Chevrolet, Ford, Dodge, or other vehicle working and looking good by making even major repairs yourself if you want to. I do. I understand that for most people, a bad transmission can be the financial breaking point where they will want to move on and get a newer car or truck. But I really believe in keeping a vehicle for as long as you can even if you have to fix the transmission yourself. If you've stayed with this class this long, you're not most people. Let's get back to work. If you haven't already done so, I invite you to watch the videos of Chrysler 46RE class, part one, lessons one through three, and see how parts and subassemblies were removed from the case and placed as you see here on the bench. Moving forward, 
the goals of the video lessons of part two are a further disassembly of the pump as well as the forward and direct drums, a final inspection as well as cleaning of all parts to determine what will need to be replaced, a look at rebuilding kits and other replacement parts, construction of a framework to support the case during assembly, and finally, the step-by-step -step reassembly of the transmission. The goals of this lesson are the disassembly of the pump, direct clutch drum, and the forward clutch drum. You should be wearing safety glasses throughout this class. If you haven't already done so, put them on now. Let's get started. Get the pump assembly from the bench and take it to another work area. Because of the extended stator support splines, working on it is easier and much less awkward if you have a workmate such as this one with an adjustable gap or simply a hole in the top of a workbench. Use your thumb and fingers or a small flathead screwdriver to remove the pump to case o-ring. Set it aside. There should be a plastic thrust washer here and we'll leave it there for now. Notice the two hook type sealing rings here as well as the grooves they should turn freely within. The rings and ring grooves on your support should look like these. The groove shoulders should have no evidence of contact with the direct clutch drum. Ragged, torn, and smeared metal next to the rings is unacceptable and is usually caused by a worn bushing in the direct drum and possibly a damaged bushing journal here. Once again, your assembly should look like this one. Finally, inspect the forward clutch sealing ring bores here and in here. They should be smooth and straight. A damaged stator support will have to be replaced and we'll make a second final inspection of these areas again later. Use a half inch or 13 millimeter six point socket and ratchet to loosen the six bolts which fasten the stator support to the pump body. Remove and set the bolts aside. Lift the stator support up and out. Inspect this surface for any damage such as gouging or deep scratches. This one is like new. Lift the pump rotors up and out of the body. These surfaces, as well as this area of the outer rotor, should be smooth. Keep them together and set them down as removed. Inspect the rotor cavity in the pump body. 
it should appear like this one. This surface, as well as the sides, should have no evidence of gouging. The pump to converter hub bushing and the front seal will be removed and replaced in a later lesson. For now, reassemble the pump, replace the rotors, and set the stator support onto the body. Rotate it until the bolt holes line up. They will only align one way. Replace the bolts finger tight. Set the pump assembly along with the O-ring back onto the parts bench. Get the forward and direct clutch drum assemblies and take them back to the workbench. Before I show you how to take apart this group of sub-assemblies, I want to spend a little time explaining the names of the parts, what they do, and the problems you may encounter while working with them. This part is called the direct clutch drum. It has two functions. First of all, it has a smooth surface here where the kick down band can apply to stop the drum from turning, which results in an upshift from first to second gear. Secondly, it also houses a hydraulic multi-disc clutch, which when applied, provides direct drive. Applying this clutch along with the low reverse band located in the rear of the main case results in reverse allowing a vehicle to back up. Normally, you should be able to easily lift up and separate the direct drum from this assembly, which is called the forward clutch drum. Unfortunately, it is very common to find the clutch steel and friction plates within this drum burned up, ruined, and distorted to the point you will not be able to simply lift it up and off. This is actually what I encountered during the teardown of this demonstration transmission. They would not come apart and I'll explain how I separated the drums in a minute. In order to show you how they should separate, I've temporarily replaced the destroyed steel plates and friction discs with new ones. If yours will separate, Set the direct drum aside. This is the forward clutch drum. It gets its name from the fact that when you place the transmission selector lever into drive position, the multi-disc clutch pack inside it is compressed together by hydraulic pressure in order to give you forward engagement. Or in other words, first gear. Let's begin disassembly of the direct clutch drum by removing this snap ring with a small screwdriver. Notice that it is a wavy type. It's made this way to cushion the application of the clutch and to prevent a harsh engagement when the transmission is placed into reverse. Set it aside. Lift out the quarter inch thick end plate.
turn it over, and set it onto the snap ring. Lift out the pack of friction and steel plates. Depending on model, your transmission may have three, four, or five friction plates and three, four, or five steel plates. This 46RE model has three of each. These plates are actually new to demonstrate what they should look like. I'll turn them over and set them onto the end plate in the order in which they were removed. I mentioned earlier that the original clutch pack I removed from this drum was destroyed. And here it is. Notice, first of all, how most of the clutch material is missing from the friction plates. Also note the damage caused by excessive slippage and heat. Not only are the plates blackened, but they're also dished and distorted. The friction and steel plates used in this transmission should always be perfectly flat. The dished condition of the plates prevents the clutch drums from being separated easily. The inner splines of the friction plates shrink and seize up on the inner hub of the forward drum. In many cases, they actually cut into and ruin the splines, as you see here. This part of the forward drum will have to be replaced. Now let me show you how to separate seized clutch drums. What I'm about to show you is how it's been done for five decades. Place a sheet of plywood at least a half inch thick on a concrete surface. Hold the drums as far as possible out in front of you at about waist height. Make sure to spread your feet and drop them onto the input shaft. You may have to do this many, many times before they separate, but they will eventually come apart. After drum separation and removal of the clutch pack, you must compress the circular steel return spring retainer in order to remove this snap ring. To do this, professionals use a device called a foot press. You set the drum like so. Adjust the height of this part which straddles the snap ring. and push the pedal down with your foot. Now you can use snap ring pliers to spread and remove the snap ring. Finally, lifting your foot releases spring tension. I don't expect you to have access to a machine like this, so we need to find another way to accomplish the same thing. Here's a solution you might consider. You can make a homebrew device from 3 quarter inch plywood, a 12 inch by 15 16 threaded rod, and three 4 inch long by 5 16 carriage bolts. You'll also need five nuts, six washers, and a wing nut. Begin by sawing eight by eight inch and five by five inch square pieces from three quarter inch plywood. Draw an X on each one to find the exact centers. Use a compass or a piece of cardboard and a push pin to draw a two inch radius four inch diameter circle. Then, drill a 5 16 hole in the middle of both pieces. If possible, use a drill press. Make three equidistant marks along the circle and drill them 
with a 5 16 inch bit. Install the three bolts with nuts and washers. Set the direct drum over the rod installed into the 8 by 8 inch wood base. Now lower the top piece onto the spring retainer. Add a washer and start the wing nut. Try to position the bolts in the middle of each group of three springs. Tighten the wing nut to depress the retainer about an eighth of an inch. Use snap ring pliers to spread the snap ring. Now loosen the wing nut and remove the tool. I'll take the drum back to the workbench. Set the snap ring aside. Lift the spring retainer up, turn it over, and set it onto the ring. Remove the nine springs and set them aside. Rotate the piston back and forth while pulling it out. Remove the outer piston lip seal with your fingertips or with the help of a mechanics pick. Set it aside. The inner seal is in a groove here in the drum. Use a mechanics pick to remove it. Set it with the outer seal. For now, set the piston back into the drum.
replace the return springs back onto the piston in groups of three. Set the retainer and snap ring loosely on top of them. Take the assembly along with the old seals back to the parts bench. Set them here. Even though new seals will be installed during the final assembly, we'll save the old lip seals for use during practice reinstallation of the piston later. Get the direct clutch friction and steel plates as well as the end plate and snap ring. Set them onto the direct clutch drum. As I mentioned earlier, this is called the forward clutch drum and it's the last sub-assembly that we need to take apart and inspect. Begin by using a small screwdriver to lift this thrust washer from this recess. Set it aside. Turn the assembly over. Use the screwdriver to remove this snap ring. Notice that, unlike the one in the direct clutch drum, it is absolutely flat. Set it aside. Next, remove a thick end plate and note that it is identical to the end plate which we removed from the direct clutch. Notice also that it is completely flat on both sides. Turn it over and set it onto the snap ring. Now reach in and remove the remaining plates. All models of this transmission family have a forward clutch stack up consisting of, first of all, the thick plate we have already set aside. Then an alternating sandwich of four friction plates and three steel plates, followed by a unique thick apply plate. One side of the apply plate is rounded where it contacts this Belleville spring. The plates of this clutch pack are ruined like the ones in the direct clutch drum. Excessive slippage and heat from low hydraulic pressure have destroyed them. This damage is typically caused by a restricted cooling system and or a clogged filter. I'll discuss problems with the cooling lines and restrictions in the radiator in a later lesson. Use a small screwdriver to pry out this snap ring. Take care not to pry on the fragile black plastic spacer ring just behind it. Set it aside. 
lift out the plastic spacer. It should be a continuous circle like this one without any separations. If yours is cracked, it will need to be replaced. Set it over the snap ring for now. Now remove this circular part. It is made from spring steel and is called a Belleville spring. It should always appear as this one does. Notice the concave shape as you hold it sideways. There should not be any separations or cracks anywhere on its surface. Set it as removed onto the rings. Pull the forward clutch piston out next. Use the screwdriver or mechanics pick to remove an inner and outer lip seal. You should save the seals for comparison with new ones later. Make sure that a small check ball is present here. Shake the piston and make sure the ball rattles to confirm it can move freely. The check ball's purpose is to allow unwanted air to weep from the cavity, leaving only fluid to move the piston. Finally, separate the outer clutch housing from the inner hub by sliding it off. Finish inspection of this assembly by noting the condition of the sealing rings here, here, and here. They should move freely and the groove shoulders should have no evidence of contact with the bore of the pump. Only the rings contact and seal against the inner bore of the pump. Check the bushing journal here and this area of the input shaft where the converter clutch piston seals for unusual wear such as scoring, deep scratches, or gouging. This is what a healthy shaft looks like. Check the inner hub splines for damage. Distorted teeth of the direct clutch friction plates have cut into and unfortunately ruined this hub. A replacement input shaft and hub assembly is available and we will use a healthier example during reassembly in a later lesson. To remain organized, loosely reassemble the forward clutch drum without reinstalling the old piston seal. Replace the outer housing onto the inner hub and put the piston into its board. Replace the Belleville spring, plastic spacer, and very wavy snap ring. It's not necessary to install it into its groove since you will remove it again later for cleaning. Set the apply plate, old friction and steels, the end plate, and flap snap ring into or against the housing. Replace the thrust washer into its recess and take the entire assembly along with the old lip seals back to the parts bench. We've accomplished our goals for this lesson. We've disassembled and inspected the pump 
as well as the forward and direct clutch drums. In the next lesson, we'll take a final and thorough look at all the parts and how to clean them, as well as make a list of damaged ones which need to be replaced. I'll also introduce the rebuilding kit and other new components we'll be using during reassembly. Finally, we'll build together an easy to make but sturdy wooden fixture to safely support the case as we assemble the transmission. I'll see you later in part two, lesson two.